This is our fourth session on 1 Thessalonians 3, 1-5, and it occurred to me at the end of our last session that I had stressed God's hand in this destiny so heavily it might raise a very good question in your mind that I need to answer. Let's read it so we get our context. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know, so he's trying to support now, give an argument for why they should not be shaken, and we argued that the argument was this. Because you know that we are destined by God, I argued, for this. God has appointed us for this suffering, this affliction. And if you were listening carefully and you have read the letter with some of chapter one lingering in your mind, you will remember, well, wait a minute. This affliction came from wicked people, right? Chapter 2, verse 14. You brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen. People. This is human beings doing the affliction, the suffering. Same thing in 2 Thessalonians 3, right? Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So these evil men, and perhaps this is Satan as well behind the evil men, are causing trouble. In fact, Paul is very aware, remember, of the opposition of Satan when he said in 1 Thessalonians 2.17, we we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. So, when I said last time, you yourselves know that we are destined by God for this, you might have legitimately raised your hand and said, "Uh, Paul believes that this suffering and affliction is coming from wicked people and from Satan. So, how can it be from God? God's not wicked. God doesn't sin. God is not satanic. So, Father, as we try to briefly address this important question that is raised repeatedly in the Bible, your sovereign providential rule over the actions of sinful men and satanic activity Grant us to regard you as holy and pure and righteous and utterly sinless. Forbid that we would ever indict you with sin or evil or wickedness. And grant that we would not in any way belittle or diminish your sovereign power over all forces, including sinful men and Satan. Oh, for understanding, Lord, that we might not be shaken in our troubles. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what are we to make of the fact that God, I don't withdraw anything I said from last time, this is God's destiny here. He's the one, according to um, Second Thessalonians that we saw has shown that the purpose of these afflictions 
is that they might be counted worthy of the kingdom for which they are suffering, and they are God's righteous decision, his righteous judgment, not a condemning judgment, but a sanctifying judgment from God. And yet, sinful men are causing the afflictions, and Satan is involved in causing the afflictions. Consider Acts chapter 4, I think probably the most important passage in the Bible with regard to an explicit statement about God's sovereign rule over sinful activity without himself being a sinner. Truly, in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. So they're praying this prayer, the early church. There were gathered together against Jesus, whom you anointed, and then he lists four enemies that came together to see Jesus killed. Herod and Pontius Pilate, one, two, along with the Gentiles, that would be like the soldiers who were involved in beating him and mocking him and nailing him to the cross, and the peoples of Israel, all the Jewish involvement, crying, crucify him, crucify him, and all these actors, these human actors, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, the Bible is crystal clear that God's hand never sins. God never acts in unrighteousness. He never acts in foolishness. He never contradicts the holiness of his nature. That's one thing the Bible affirms over and over. And the Bible also says that his plan and his hand predestined the murder of his son. That's the gospel. If God didn't do it, there's no gospel in it. If it was just a random act of evil Herod and evil Pilate and evil Gentiles and evil Israel, if it's just a random lack of justice that just overcame an innocent man and put him to death, then there is no good news. There is no substitutionary atonement. There is no design of God to remove his wrath and close hell and open heaven and forgive sin and give eternal joy. That's all bunk unless God ordained the murder of his son. And if he can ordain or destine, that's the word we have back here, destine the murder of his son and not be a sinner, then it is not a problem. It's a less problem for him to destine the afflictions of the Thessalonians who were in fact afflicted by sinful human beings and sinful Satan. So that's my resolution biblically of the observation that these afflictions came from men who were evil and they came from God because God uses governs Satan and sinful men in the sanctifying of his people. Let me give you one last illustration of this from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul says, to keep me humble and from being proud, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. Now, whose desire and design is it to remove conceit, sinful arrogance, conceit, and pride from Paul's life? It's God's. God wants that to happen. So this is a thorn given, given by God, because it is sanctifying. The thorn is intended to protect against pride. And then he calls it a messenger of Satan. Now, Satan 
wants Paul to be conceited, right? He wants him to be proud and arrogant and make ruin of his own faith and destroy his ministry. That's what Satan wants. And so Satan's design is not in this thorn to remove conceit. Satan's design is that the thorn ruin Paul's faith. And God has a different design. Only he uses Satan. Now, there's many questions you can ask about why would he do that? Well, maybe to show what an idiot Satan is and how completely in control he is and how God is always making Satan to serve his own purposes. That's clearly what's going on here. Satan is serving God's purpose in this thorn to keep Paul humble, which must gall Satan that his own designs get wrecked so that it comes back on his own head with holiness. The thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. It's not wrong to pray against affliction. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That's God's design in this thorn. Paul's humility, God's grace. God's design, and poor Satan is put to use in the sanctification of God's people. So, when it says that these afflictions are destined by God, that's no contradiction of saying the afflictions also came through the hand of Satan, and they came through the hands of wicked people. Next time, here's the question. Back in chapter 1, it says, We know, brothers beloved by God, that he has chosen you. You are among the elect of God before the foundation of the world. And now, in verse 5, he sends to learn about their faith, lest somehow the tempter, Satan, has tempted them and his labor would be in vain. How could his labor be in vain if they are elect? That's what we talk about next time.